And at first, Haig was going to head up the crisis management team, but then at the last minute, about three days before the shooting, Bush was put in to head the crisis management team, and the press couldn't quite figure out what it was, and they were chasing him around saying, what's a crisis, and what's crisis management, and what's this all got to do with? And what it has to do with, of course, is transfer of power and control uh, in uh, either natural or created crises in the White House. Uh, and, uh, and at the level of the presidency. So they asked Bush three days before the shooting, how would you define a crisis? And Bush says, the president will know it when he sees it. <laughs> Flat on his back, I suppose, was the scenario. Um, and I think he did see it coming out of that uh, Hilton there in Washington, and I did extensive work on the uh, ballistics. None of Hinckley's bullets uh, hit Mr. Reagan. Uh, Hinckley had six bullets in the gun. Uh, one hit Delahanty, a cop, and threw him to the ground by nicking him on his, uh, grazing his shoulder and neck. Another went into uh, the groin of the agent McCarthy. A 160-pound man lifted him up and threw him back to the other end of the limousine. Uh, another bullet, the initial bullet fired by Hinckley, uh, hit Mr. Brady in the head knocked him to the ground, did considerable brain damage. And one bullet nicked the windshield of the limousine. One bullet went into the Universal office building across the street. And one bullet went into the trunk of the car. And you can see when you look at the photos closely, a very clear hole, not a ricochet or a scar mark, but a hole going into the car, penetrating the, the outer metal wall. The bullet that hit Reagan hit him by all counts at an early point. When, when the limousine pulled up uh, to deliver him to his talk, um, it pulled up at the door where he was to go in. I suppose if you rented a limousine, you'd expect it to come to your door, not two doors down the block. If you're the President of the United States, they will move it six inches to make it sure it lines up with the door. Uh, they were following standard security procedure when he got there. The limousine stopped, the door opened, the Secret Service got out on both sides and formed a human wall. And then Reagan gets out and walks through that wall a couple of seconds into the door of the VIP entrance and through some non-public halls and up an elevator and out on the stage. It comes back by the same route in order to beat the crowd out. This was specifically designed there at the Hilton for that purpose, this route. But when he comes out, the limousine inexplicably is about 40 feet down the curb, nowhere near the door, uh, so he has to walk out into the open. When the President walks in the open, the Secret Service are supposed to stand on either side into the front and back, as well as other points, but at least a protective diamond. The Secret Service file out all to his right, a line of ducks. They told him that morning, no security problem, Mr. President, you needn't wear your vest. He raised his hand to wave. Some called Mr. President, raised his hand to wave, and at that point he's hit. You can tell he's hit he, in the Kennedy assassination because the missile went into his lung. The lung begins to collapse, the air is blown out, and the cheeks expand. And you get a grimace on the face. His, uh, his shoulder slumps a little bit. He's clearly in pain. Um, and all of the magazines, Time Magazine, go back to that point, show Reagan is hit. He's up like this. But that point is at almost the same second that Hinckley's first bullet is fired and hits Brady in the head. And realizing that Reagan is not dead, Secret Service Agent Parr begins to push him into the car in front of him. And he's, Reagan's already in the car, and Parr, about a third of the way into the car, when Hink Hinkley's last shot is fired. So there's no chance in timing or angles or anything else for these bullets to hit Reagan. The reaction of all the other people is much different than Reagan. Reagan's still standing and then he gets into the car. So uh, they're all lying around the ground from these 38 shots. If a 38 caliber, even a 22 caliber bullet had hit Reagan, he wouldn't have been wondering whether something had happened to him. Uh, a good assassin, even if you have your vest on, knows that when you raise your hand, you expose your heart. Oh. <laughs> and uh, and the, uh, the situation was that up top 
of the retaining wall on the area that I call the bushy knoll. <laughs> was the assassin. And he was firing not a 38 or a 22, but a very, very specific weapon developed by the intelligence agencies, which is a uh, CO2 propelled flechette. These are little razor edged or sharp discs, or they have them, earlier versions were li like little tube rockets, about a half an inch long, very thin with stabilizing fins. Then they got into these, these little discs that are razor edged and delta shaped or airline shaped so that they. And this thing makes no noise. It's just a little puff of CO2 gas, and it can be fired with accuracy up, up to an amazing distance. Um, some of the guns that incorporated this early technology were revealed by Senator Church during the CIA assassination studies in Congress, and they had a look like a German Luger with a rifle scope on it that would fire these things accurately with the scope to the length of a football field. So there's no problem with aiming them or getting them to do the job. Uh, and I have to assume that that Luger was the expendable technology and they got better or they wouldn't show it to us on TV. And they can shoot you from a satellite. They don't have to worry about a gun barrel. But uh, not, not with a 22, of course, but with, a, uh, with, with other types of energy and heat generating stuff they can send down by satellite. And if they can knock a... ICBM missile traveling through outer space out of the sky. I'm sure they can catch you on the street. Um, so once they get Star Wars in place, the cities are the first target, I think. They can start firestorms and other things. But this guy made such a little wound with this, with this uh, disc. They often uh, contain poison and might have, in Reagan's case, that later led to the cancer, but also can just be used. I think the idea was to penetrate the heart, but it deflected on the seventh rib and went into the lung and missed the aorta by about a quarter of an inch. Uh, they couldn't find the bullet. The nurses couldn't find a bullet wound. Now this is GWU hospital emergency room in DC. Uh, they've seen bullet wounds, believe me. <laughs> they didn't know what was wrong. They thought he was having a heart attack. Finally, when they got all his clothes cut off, the nurse saw what she described and I read the medical uh, magazines about this and she said it was a little razor slit about an inch long with some black blood coming out of it, a little line of blood. And then she thought, well, you know, maybe he's been hit with something. But that isn't what a 22 or a 38 hole would look like. Uh, and then they went in and they couldn't find it and they almost closed him up. They did three different x-rays to find the bullet. And then the doctor, the last time, just before closing, got the thing in his hand and his lung tissue and pulled it out. And he described it in the medical magazine as round uh, flat as a dime, as round as a dime, about that size, and flat, razor edged. And then he hands it to the FBI that's waiting patiently. <laughs> and it goes the way of all good bullets uh, back into the history bin. So uh, we don't hear about that bullet anymore. We hear about these uh, 22 exploding shells and ricochet, ricochet shot that must have hit the back of the car and gone between the door. Uh, of the car and gotten into Reagan on his way in because otherwise how do you explain the wound described by Dr. Uh, O'Donnell that night at the press conference as a 45 degree downward back to front left to right wound when I, you have Reagan here and Hinkley down about where you are how are you going to get me from back there uh, you know it just didn't fit so then you got to bend Reagan over like this and, the bullet ricochet and come back in from the other side of the car or something. I mean, you know, it was almost as impossible as the magic bullet in the Kennedy assassination, but these are minor details when you're killing a president. Uh, they did not expect him to survive. They got into the car without even police escort, and they yelled, Rawhide is okay, Rawhide being his code name at the time. Rawhide is okay. You know, oops, <laughs> gigs up. So next plan B. And Brady at that point is lying on the ground bleeding. Uh, and there is an early report that Brady is dead. Then there's a report that Reagan is shot. Then that Brady's shot or not shot or not dead. Or Reagan's not dead or Reagan's dead. And it went back and forth like that for a while. The press couldn't seem to get it straight. 
And I'm turning on everything I can turn on, radio and TV, you know, the minute I hear it, because I know you're going to get the only news in the first few minutes. And the, uh, the situation is somebody comes in to GWU Hospital on a stretcher. Secret Service all around. And they come in a few minutes before and they clear out the emergency room. Uh, and they bring this guy through on the stretcher. So everybody assumes it's Reagan, he's hit, maybe he's dead, and he's going into surgery. Uh, but in fact, having looked at the case very closely, I now realize that that was Brady. Brady beat Reagan to the hospital. Brady, who took three more minutes to even get an ambulance near him, got to GWU before Reagan did. And then in the book that McCarthy writes about protecting the president um, that day, he says that they got in the car and they said, uh, they were going to take him to the hosp nearest hospital, which you've got to do. And so they went up T Street to Connecticut, and they said into the thing, we're going right. We're going to, and then he says another code word, doesn't put it in there, but he says it means the White House. And uh, if you go right on Connecticut Avenue at T Street in Washington, D.C., you're heading north, away from the White House, and up to another place, in Maryland, uh, where the body of John Kennedy got taken, called Bethesda Naval Hospital, so that the United States Navy intelligence can finish the job on Mr. Reagan. In fact, Secret Service agents argued with hospital staff at GWU all night until 6 in the morning. They finally gave up trying to move him up to Bethesda. They wanted to do the killing and the autopsy up there, where they could control it. They didn't want him down in a public hospital. but. A huge fight broke out between the Reagan loyalists and the Bush loyalists in the Situation Room in that hour at the command and control module, which is the communication module in the White House for all the nuclear and crisis commands, sat Helena von Dahm, Reagan's appointment secretary and Otto von Bolschwing's employee. And the fight ensued to the point that a deal was made to let Reagan live, as long as he got out of the way. Haig emerged, shaken, Bush's man, and said, gentlemen, I am in charge here until the vice president returns. Bush was flying out in Dallas on uh, Air Force One, and so the transition of power, I believe, happened at that point. Hinckley was an easy enough patsy to set up and blame the murder on. Uh, Reagan managed to survive, but then from then on, basically went out to Camp David, watched old movies with Nancy, uh, waved at the press, you know, oh, I'm the president, I want to see my boots, and, uh, and Bush ran the White House. <laughs>